Welcome to the Evolution of Evolution, Part 3, Middle Ages. As invading Goths came into Rome and ransacked and pillaged, they had very little respect for written word being illiterate. As a result, much of Western thought would have been lost if not for a light in this dark time. Far to the east in what is now Iraq was the Abbasid Caliphate the Muslim Empire's branch that promoted a golden age of learning and as a result also served to continue the preservation of the works of the ancient Greeks and Romans. We turn our attention now to an early Islamic scholar by the name of Al-Jahiz. Al-Jahiz created a book known simply as the Book of Animals. In it, he put forward some of the earliest ideas of how to group animals by type, a simple phylogeny, if you will, the concept of a food chain as to which animals preyed upon which, and put forward three aspects of evolution. The first being the changing of one species to another. Second, he put forward the idea that the struggle for survival was a factor. And third, he put forth the idea that adapting to the environment was a factor. These three aspects put together are the bases of natural selection. Now to the 1300s and Ibn Khaldun, master of historiography, sociology, economics, biology, and many other subjects. A renaissance man before there was a renaissance, if you will. Ibn Khaldun was the author of the Muqaddimah. Uh, in this book, he studied various subjects, and among them he put forward a concept towards evolution, though his evolution was more on a spiritual level than a physical one, it still focused on the idea of transcending through species. From the Mokadima, The whole of existence in its simple and composite worlds is arranged in a natural order of ascent and descent, so that everything constitutes an uninterrupted continuum. The essences at the end of each particular stage of the worlds are by nature prepared to be transformed into the essence adjacent to them, either above or below them. This is the case with the simple material elements, it is the case with the palms and vines, the last stage of plants, in their relation to snails and shellfish, the lowest stage of animals. It is also the case with monkeys, creatures combining in themselves cleverness and perception in their relation to man, the being, who has the ability to think and reflect. The preparedness that exists on either side at each stage of the worlds is meant when we speak about their connection. For our last one of this installment, we'll be looking at Thomas Aquinas. You will notice that he is out of chronological order compared to what I've been doing in the past and occurs in the 13th century, well after Al-Jahi's Book of Animals, but a bit before Ibn Khaldun's Mokadima. I have chosen to set him out of chronological order in order to keep the cultural identities together with the Muslim contributions. As previously mentioned, the invading Goths causing the fall of the Roman Empire resulted in a loss of knowledge with the destruction of writings by the illiterate people. As a result of the Crusades later, however, those works were reintroduced from where the Muslims had preserved them back to Europe. A influx of old ideas that had been lost were now washing back into the Dark Ages of Europe. The return of the scientific understanding of the ancient Greeks and Romans led to conflict with the orders of faith within the Catholic Church. One man, Thomas Aquinas, later to be canonized as St. Thomas, attempted to reconcile some of the old philosopher's works with the theology of the Bible. His primary attempt was to find a balance between the teachings of Aristotle and the teachings of the Catholic Church. In order to do this, he resorted heavily towards influences from St. Augustine, who had originally proposed the concept that science and biblical works should not contradict each other, but should be used to complement each other as mentioned in a previous installment of this series. One of the things that Thomas Aquinas noticed was that Aristotle had proposed the concept of a first cause, 
the idea that everything in existence had to have something that started it. This has gone on to be known as the Kalam cosmological argument. The Kalam cosmological argument is uh, an argument that can be simply formulated. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Things don't come into being from nothing. Two, the universe began to exist. There's good philosophical and scientific evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had a beginning. And from that it follows three, therefore, a cause of the universe exists. And then you do a conceptual analysis of what it is to be a cause of space and time, matter and energy. And I think you're able to show that a beginningless, uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, enormously powerful, personal creator of the universe exists. The cosmological argument has been used as a justification for the idea of the existence of a god. However, it is very unlikely that Aristotle would have been referring to the Christian god as he predates Christianity, and that he might be referring to one of the other dozens, hundreds, thousands of gods people believe in, and there is actually nothing in the argument that presupposes or guarantees the idea that this first cause had to be intelligent at all and couldn't be a non-sentient force, such as the current model for the Big Bang Theory. Following this logic, Thomas Aquinas organized the idea that the first cause could cause subsequent causes that expanded out indefinitely, sort of like the knocking over the first domino, so to speak. This worked completely in hand with the idea of evolution, in the concept of the god creating the first life and allowing it to chain effect out from that point. The diagram I am showing here will show the similarities between the uncaused cause concept and the evolutionary tree. While Thomas Aquinas did not contribute a whole lot directly to our understanding of evolution itself, I felt it important to include him in this presentation as a symbolic bridge of the gap between creationism and evolution. The idea that as Thomas Aquinas put forward a first cause, the religion and science need not be incompatible. The only problem is when people stick to literal meanings instead of doing as St. Augustine had recommended and allowing science to run its course and faith to run its course independent of each other.